Okay, I think we should start. So hello and welcome to this webinar organized by the Center of Public Understanding of Finance, Institutions and Networks. Uh, please note that this webinar is recorded and the recording will be available to you uh, from our Center's webpage. So one of the key objectives of the Center is to organize events that will create a dialogue between academics and non-academics to, to discuss different perspectives on societal challenges such as the pandemic, climate change, sustainability, and social inclusiveness. More information about the Center and free online learning resources produced by Center members are available on our webpage. So given the, the large number of registered audience, uh, we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please add your questions in the chat box. Please like any questions that you'd like asked. The more likes, the more chances that it will be asked. So about the event today, it is an absolute honor to have Professor Mark Freeman provide a stimulating discussion on different views that academics and public may hold around climate change and its impacts. Mark is a professor of finance and the Dean of York Management School, University of York. He has also held academic positions in Loughborough, Warwick, Bradford and Exeter and visiting positions in Australia and the US. Uh, Mark has done extensive research on topics related to pensions and social discount rates, which as you will see in the presentation today, play an important role in climate policy. He has provided guidance to government bodies in the UK and abroad. His work has also informed policies related to transport and pensions. Uh, I would also like to introduce uh, Professor Nick Braithwaite. Nick is a professor of engineering physics and the executive dean of our STEM faculty. And he also leads the Open University's sustainability goals. So before we hear from Mark, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Braithway to say a little bit about the Open University's sustainability goals. Uh, so over to you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Yes, um, environmental issues come within our sustainability vision at the Open University, and that is to create and share knowledge and skills to realize social and environmental justice. And our learn and live strategy uh, has five main goals and one of those features sustainability and that's along with things like uh, the increasing our reach to students, our impact through our, our research and teaching and uh, the success of our students and the equity of our approach and sustainability is right up there. It's deeply embedded in the organization now. As a business, the OU has an obligation, of course, to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions like any other business, direct and indirect. So we've already got a commitment to divest from fossil fuel extractions by 2023. I say already, it, it, it happened quite quickly, that commitment. Um, and COP26 was very instrumental in pushing us over that edge. Uh, and also pressure from our student body. Uh, we've, with respect to net zero emissions, so our energy and water for the estate, by 2030, then we plan that we will certainly be uh, at net zero there. And before 2050, we hope to get net zero emissions from our supply chain and travel. Those, of course, are the harder ones to, to control and to reach. Uh, on the travel, we've got some immediate control that we can do, but uh, it, it longer term, we have quite a lot of cultural change to bring about. And we're pushing the message when it comes to the OU as a business. We're pu pushing the message that sustainability is actually everybody's business. As an educator, the open uh, and being open to people, places, methods and ideas, then we've got an even stronger moral imperative. Our formal learning includes, of course, sustainability and environmental programs within specific model, uh, modules. We have them specifically, we have programs specifically on environment uh, and we have various faculty interests and importantly, into faculty programs for curriculum aimed at educating, informing, engaging people with the issues of environmental sustainability. We aim to embed sustainability actually throughout our curriculum as well as in those obvious areas. And we're proposing at the moment an authentic sustainability context for a major fraction of our assessment. Uh, one of the things about our students is that they're already embedded in life very richly as, and the fitting their studies into that um, means that they have a, a really good realistic perspective uh, on things and we need to help them in the way that we assess to create that knowledge, to transfer that knowledge 
uh, into those real contexts that they're already living. We have, when it comes to um, uh, the sharing of knowledge, we have a, a open learn a platform of free resources, many of which is uh, drawn from our formal content, but it's put there in an informal context. And in that space, we have a sustainability hub, which collects a number of uh, pieces from our modules addressing sustainability, particularly environmental sustainability. Uh, and we'll be enhancing that in the very near future by uh, consolidating it with our COP26 hub, which is a, a specific area of open learn. It can be found simply by going to open learn COP26 uh, and you'll come across that hub. And there are 32 articles there inspired by COP26. Uh, with future learn, we're also exploring micro-credentials as a vehicle for credit bearing social learning. And at this stage, I'm going to change uh, my background. OK, so I've now got a background which uh, just features those particular micro-credentials, tackling the climate crisis using innovations from Cuba, a climate change uh, view from the polar regions, tools for the climate crisis, and just started uh, on Monday of this week, Climate Change Transforming Your Organization for Sustainability. Uh, these are credit bearing, and we are very keen to push these out as a form of social learning on environmental issues aimed at professional development and reskilling markets. Now, sustainability and societal impact also is important to our research agendas, uh, and we have Many examples, I'm going to choose just one, it's called astrobiology, it's interdisciplinary, it's interfaculty, and there's a very good transfer of knowledge and, and interest and, and uh, exploration, enthusiasm for a subject like astrobiology, which looks as if it's just off this planet, but it isn't. It starts in this planet and looks at uh, uh, life in extreme regions of our environment here, and it links across to our uh, geographies, and it links across to uh, some of the people engaged in research in law because space law, before we go off polluting other planets, we'd better get our laws in order and our understandings in order. Anyway, um, that's enough about the OU and its environmental issues for now. I'd like to welcome Mark Freeman to give his personal perspective on academic expertise, climate change and policy advocacy. Mark. So thank you very much indeed for your kind words and for inviting me today. Now, I want you to imagine that you're lucky enough to come to the Open University and do a finance module with Ali. Now, one of the first things he'd teach you about is about discount rates. The fact that a pound today is worth more than a pound tomorrow. And the discount rate determines how much more a pound is worth today than a pound is worth tomorrow. And unfortunately, although I've been working in academia for 30 years, I've never really got beyond Ali's week three, because my research has never really progressed beyond worrying about discount rates. But I worry about discount rates in one particular context. The first thing is that I look at how governments use discount rates. So how much should we pay today for the promise of a social benefit in the future? And the second issue is that I look at very, very long term problems. So I look at problems of many decades potentially going into many centuries. And the reason why this is an interesting topic and, and, and something that motivates me is because of the compounding effect of interest. And because interest compounds, very small differences in the discount rate lead to very different present values, very different valuation on social projects. So we have hypersensitivity of the valuation to the choice of the discount rate. And Marty Weitzman from, from Harvard once described this as one of the most crucial problems in all of economics. 
Now, this has a range of applications, one of which is to do with the high speed to rail link and the way that that's valued by governments. But I want to talk about the social cost of carbon. I want you to imagine the open university, which is being heated and the heating system is emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Now that's going to stay in the atmosphere for a very, very long time, centuries. And as a consequence of that, damages will be done to the ecosystem, to human systems, and to the economy. And because of that, um, they need to think about how they're going to regulate it. And the way in which they regulate it is that they, they monetize all the damages. They assign a monetary value to all the social, environmental, and economic damages that will occur in the future. Now, many people in the audience might think they shouldn't do that, and it's certainly an incredibly difficult thing to do. How do you put an economic value on the bleaching of coral reefs, for example? But nevertheless, this is what is done by policymakers, whether it is right or wrong, because it allows us to compare things in the same units, and all the damages are therefore monetized into dollars. Now, I don't get involved in that monetization process. I enter the scene when we have a time series, a long time series of damages in dollar terms that have been estimated by environmental economists. And then what governments need is they need a discount rate to bring that time series of damages back to a present value and that present value is called the social cost of carbon. Now why do regulators want to do this? Well the reason is best explained I think I could never speak better on this than President Obama so I'm going to try and switch what I'm presenting to show you a short video from him. I have I have long believed that the most elegant way to drive innovation and to reduce carbon emissions is to put a price on it. Um, this is a uh, classic market failure. Right? If, you, if you open up a Econ 101 textbook, uh, it, it'll say, you know, the market's very good about determining prices and allocating capital uh, towards its most productive use, except there's certain externalities, there's certain things that the market just doesn't count, it doesn't price, uh, at least not on its own. Clean air is an example, clean water, uh, or the converse, dirty water, dirty air. Uh, so that's an explanation of President Obama of how the social cost of carbon is used to set regulatory prices and particularly to set carbon taxes. This has become uh, increasingly important recently because when President Biden came to power last year, one of the first things he did was he introduced, actually on the day he came to power, Executive Order 13990 that effectively wanted to reintroduce estimates of the social cost of carbon which had been stopped under the Trump administration. And this executive order put in place an interagency working group to come up with an initial valuation within 30 days, when what they did was they went back to the estimates of the Obama administration, and then to put in place a longer term project to come up with more recent estimates of these greenhouse gases. And this was due to be published in January, but has been delayed. Now, we were contacted by the interagency working group, my co-authors and I, to give them advice on what discount rate they should use within a policy context in the United States when working out these costs of greenhouse gas emissions. And as a consequence of that, we have put a public consultation 
um, a, a document in to the work that the interagency working group has done. But the plot thickens. Ten Republican states have gone to the state of Louisiana requesting a preliminary injunction saying effectively that President Biden is exceeding his executive power by doing this. And that therefore the social cost of carbon estimates that come out from the interagency working group cannot be used for policy purposes. And as you'll note at the bottom, one of the particular things that these states picked up on was the choice of discount rate, which was the thing on which we had advised the IWG. And this went to the court because the state said that this was going to cost in the region of half a trillion dollars and that that was too much to put through on an executive order in short. Now, this injunction was granted on the 22nd of February this year, and therefore we are in a bit of a legal uh, conundrum. Almost immediately after this, uh, President Biden and the associated agencies um, appealed this in the Fifth Circuit Courts um, against the 10 Republican states, saying that absolutely this interagency working group needed to do this work. Um, and as you'll see, um, the Drep et al. in yellow is a paper of mine and my co-authors. We find ourselves cited in a few places in this appeals document that came out of, at the beginning of the month. So I like to think of this as being a solar system, and it's a solar system of politics and regulation and law with uh, Executive Order 13990 sitting at the, uh, at the centre of it. And I and my co-authors are standing on the outer reaches of the Kuiper Belt, somewhat under its gravitational influence, but a very, very long way away from the center of power. But nevertheless, this makes me think, and this is what I want to talk about today, is this makes me think about how I should engage as an academic rather than as a voter when I interact with the interagency working group or the treasury in the UK or the Department of Transport. What are the rules of engagement that I should pursue when I do this? And it's particularly important to say, I think, that I don't claim to have any global truths on this. Uh, many of my co-authors take a very different position on this to my own. But this is a personal perspective, and I want to give you my personal perspective on how I engage with policymakers. Now, before I do that, I'd quite like to get an idea of um, your views on climate change. So I would be very grateful if you would go to menti.com and type in 3821-2848. Or alternatively, if you would just scan the QR code and, uh, and that should take you there directly. I'll just give you a second to get in. What you should be seeing on your phones or your mobile tablets uh, is something like this. Ali, can I pick on you? Can you see it? Yes, I can see it now, Mark. And the code is on the top of the slide. So I've just used that code. Fantastic. So yes. menti.com and then that code. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask five questions, which just lets me understand something about the audience I'm talking to do, talking to today, because I've, I've made some assumptions about you as an audience, as I'll explain later. And I just want to see if my uh, if if my prior position is correct. OK, everybody ready to go. Have you all got your fingers warmed up, ready for the exercise at hand? The first question is a qualitative question. We are facing a climate catastrophe, climate emergency, a climate problem, 
or climate normality. Fantastic. I mean, I think a pattern is beginning to emerge. Nobody here thinks this is climate normality. A few of you think it's a climate problem, but the vast majority of you are somewhere between emergency and catastrophe. So uh, thank you very much indeed for that. The next question asks you to quantify this. So compared to today, by 2100, how much do you think global temperatures are likely to have risen by? So nobody thinks less than half a degree. A few of you think four degrees or more with a couple above six degrees, but the, the vast bulk of you are between half a degree and four degrees with most of you in the higher of those two categories. Thank you. Oh, sorry, somebody just pinged in there. Sorry, Ali, I missed that. Next slide, to save a thousand people in 200 years time or 180 years time, how many people would you sacrifice today? So you've got a magic button, you've got a firing squad in front of you and you have to authorize the firing squad to shoot people in exchange for saving a thousand people's lives in 2020. How many lives would you sacrifice today? It's a tough question, right? So I don't want to give away my conclusion, but I'll tell you the Treasury has an answer to this, this question. And the oh, you're still coming in. Um, the, the, the Treasury's answer is it would sacrifice about 500 lives today for a thousand people in the future, and it would be fairly explicit in making that decision. It makes it in healthcare contexts around um, quality of life years and so on. Okay, I want I want to. Um, I want you to think about. Uh, paying for carbon neutrality. What are we what are we going to get the government to do? Are we going to get the government to spend more by increased taxes or by borrowing more? Are we going to get it to move money from elsewhere? Are we going to tax corporations effectively, um, regulate corporations to pay a carbon tax and stop them from putting it onto households? Or are we going to put it onto household energy bills? I know in a perfect world it'll be a combination, but I'm just trying to get a sense of where you are. So a little bit more of a spread here but it seems to be going after corporations who emit and then getting more government action through increased taxes and debt seems to be uh, predominantly where you are as an audience. Just the final one. If the government, I know you didn't all suggest this should happen, but suppose we started to reallocate existing public spending to fund carbon neutrality. What should we, what should we cut spending on? Thank you. 
Thank you so much for engaging with this. I really appreciate it. And as you can appreciate, there are no right answers to any of these questions. Or certainly the no right answers to the to the funding questions anyway. So defence by a mile and then state pensions next and then a couple of other odd you know, and slightly unusual votes around healthcare, social care and education. Um, thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, you have given me the answers that I was sort of expecting. Um, and so this does fit in uh, with what I'm going to say later on. So when I engage in policymakers, I'm in a field that is highly politicised. And therefore, the question is the extent to which I um, advocate for climate change action. And this is called, and there are some great examples here, one at the top to do with climate change, one at the bottom to do with COVID very early on, you know, a month or so into COVID. And we'll start with the bottom one. We scientists said lockdown, but UK politicians refused to listen. For 11 fateful days in March, the government ignored the best corona advice. It must learn from this mistake. So this is a very clear view on how academics should engage with policy. When something serious comes along, we tell the politicians to move aside and we'll take over the policy for them. The top one's a bit more subtle, but is also in there. The scientific community is clear. We must take strong action in, in the second sentence. And you'll notice that a segue between science and action, between the scientific community saying something about policy. And these people, people who take this sort of approach are called issues advocates. They effectively use their knowledge very directly within the policy making process with a view to influencing specific policies. So as it's described here by Christensen, Knowledge is used as political ammunition to get a political outcome that you want. Now, I work with lots of climate scientists. I've co-authored with Michael Mann, um, who absolutely sit as issues advocates, who think it is their responsibility as academics to advocate for climate change action. There are also people in the world, in the room, who are much closer to being pure scientists, and their view is at the absolute opposite extreme to this. They think that our job as scientists is just to publish papers, to do proper research, publish papers, and then if a policymaker happens to pick that up, then that's purely incidental to the academic activity. The academic activity is doing the research. Now, I've positioned myself there as a science arbiter, and that is how I see myself. And this is someone who does look to engage actively in policy making, but I limit myself to answering specific scientific questions about intergenerational discount rates. And therefore, I see myself in this sort of prov provider of evidence based policy where I have a special status as an academic, as a provider of neutral and apolitical evidence. As I say, this is not a global truth. Many of my co-authors do not take this position, but this is where I am. And because I'm in this position, I sort of, I'm clearly not a civil servant, but I see myself acting sort of within the civil service code where I must serve the government, because the government represents the people, whatever its political persuasion. So to give you an example of that, I work with the Treasury in the UK under a Conservative government, and I'm working with the Interagency Working Group in the States under a Democratic government. So my first thing I think I have to do as, a, as an academic in a democratic system is to work with the government. Second, I try not to, I think it is impossible to do this perfectly, but the position I take 
is that I try to disassociate my personal political views um, from the advice I give. In other words, I would give the same advice to all parties. But, and the but is crucial here, you are not expected to be politically naive. If you engage with policymakers, you have to understand you're in a political context and you have to be sensitive to the politics of those you're engaged with. So I want to do a sociological exercise. This is uh, Extinction Rebellion. And Ali said that there might be some people from Extinction Rebellion today. And I'd love to see your, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to chat to you because here you are as a group. And, and I'd like you to look at this as a sociological exercise. Imagine these people have put down their placards and have gone shopping in Sainsbury's. What words would you use to describe them as individuals rather than as climate activists? So I just want you to think of what you think of them as people. I'll just give you a second to do that. Um, my next slide, of course, is the other side of this, which is the Gilets Jaunes in France and carbon tax protesters in Australia and Canada. And again, forget their placards. Many of you, well, we have already seen from the Mentimeter that most of you in the room absolutely have no sympathy with this political view. But look at them as people. And how would you describe them if you saw them outside your local supermarket? Now, the point I'm trying to make is that I don't think you need to be a sociologist to know that this group are different to this group. And when we look at this, this is in the American context because it's America I'm talking about today. There are very clear things that give you a, a clear indication of what position someone is going to take on climate change. So sex and race have very little effect. The things that do have an effect are being younger, having a higher income, being better educated, and particularly in the United States, this is a massively partisan issue between political ideologies and political affiliations. So if I'd asked you a more specific question about these two groups and said, which, if they had a mandate in the states, do you think would be more likely to vote Democrat? And which do you think would be more likely to vote Republican? I think you would sort of see where this, where I'm going with this. So if my job is to be politically savvy, but to be politically neutral, I need to understand where the battleground is between the different people I talk to. And this, I think, is a key slide. You can see on the orange bars on the right that Democrats consistently think, you know, overwhelmingly think, that climate change policies are helpful to the environment rather than hindering the environment. So what we are doing for climate change is doing good. But they believe something even stronger, which is that the creation of green investment and the creation of green jobs means that we get a free lunch out of helping the environment. And that is that we will also help the economy. So the investment in, in the green landscape will help the economy. By contrast, Republicans start with the economy and they say this is poor investment. This is not value creating investment and therefore it's going to hinder the economy. And that is their starting position. But worse than that, and what I think many of you in the audience will find counterintuitive, is that they don't even think that this th these things help the environment. They think they are dirty technologies that do not necessarily even help the environment. And so you can just see how bipartisan this issue is on the fundamentals of the problem. 
Now, you might say, well, they're Republicans. They're stupid, right? But the next slide gives you a bit of a, oh, sorry. The next couple of slides are going to give you a problem on this. So I want to concentrate on the Republican view. And this is not, I absolutely cannot stress enough, this is not because I am siding with this view, but it's because I think it is the view that is less well represented in an academic context. And your earlier answers, which I predicted, suggest that very few of you, if you were in the United States, would vote Republican. So here's a great quote from the New York Times that says the Republicans are the planet, the party that ruins the planet. The Republican climate denial is even scarier than Trumpism. And I am sure that this is a view that many of you in the room today will be sympathetic with. But we're an odd group, academics. We live in our own sociological bubble. And we are not like the population. And we're not like the pop not just the general population, we are also not like other cognitively elite people, defined here as the top 5% of the population by IQ. And what we have here is we have political affiliation in the UK, very similar evidence in the US. And you can see that compared to the general population, academics are very unlikely to be conservative or UKIP voters, which is the black bar, and much, much, much more likely to be Labour or Green supporters or supporting other parties. And therefore, in universities, I think we have to be aware that, that, that we are a slightly unusual political context and that therefore, if, if you are politically neutral, but politically savvy, you slightly have to go out of your way a little bit to, to understand the opposing view. So I'm just going to spend a little time on that. Now, the New York Times defined the Republicans as climate deniers. So the first question we must ask is, is that true? And the answer is probably not. So a climate denier has a formal definition. It's a person who does not accept that climate change is happening or does not accept that it is caused by human activity such as burning fossil fuels. It's an absolutism. It's I do not believe this is happening. But if you actually go out and ask Republicans, and there's a big survey here by the Pew Research Center, in fact, 88% of Republicans do think that human activity is contributing to climate change. This is a question about extent. It is not a question about absolutes. And if you read my work for this reason, I will never use the term climate denier. It's too binary. Um, I, I use the term climate skeptic in my work because it is about the degree to which human activity contributes to climate change. This is a key slide. Do you think that the seriousness of global warming is ge generally exaggerated? Almost no Democrats think that. So if you're on the political left, you are extremely unlikely to agree with that sentence. Whereas if you're on the political right, you're very likely to agree with that sentence, particularly in the United States, less so in the UK. Again, notice the question is not about whether global warming is real or a hoax. It is about the extent of the potential threat. This was the chart I thought I was coming to earlier. It's easy to think that the reason for this is that Republicans are poorly educated and they don't know what they're talking about. This is another core slide. This is the percentage of Republicans or Democrats who say that human activity contributes a great deal to global climate change. Again, emphasis on the word a great deal. 
And amongst Democrats, you can see, as you'd expect, that Democrats are much, much, much more likely to agree with this sentence than Republicans are. But the low, medium and high here are to do with your level of scientific knowledge, how scientifically educated you are. And you can see that amongst Democrats, amongst an, an academic type audience that tends to be left leaning, is, has high income, has high education. The higher your science education, the more likely you are to agree with this sentence. But the problem is that for Republicans on the left, it is the reverse. It is those with the highest science education are those who are most likely to be sceptical about this. So you can imagine me as a politically neutral, but a politically, hopefully reasonably savvy person talking to highly educated people on the two sides of the debate who just fundamentally disagree over the veracity of this statement. So, so why are Republicans saying this? What is, what is leading them to say this? Well, this is from the IPCC AR6 Working Group 1, which has came out last year. What we had on the right are different emissions pathways. So 1.9 is very low emissions pathways. Um, probably even, I think that's negative emissions technologies. 8.5 is very high um, emissions scenarios. And then you've got different emissions scenarios in the middle. Now, it is interesting that not one of you said that um, temperature change was going to be less than half a degree between now and the end of the century. But that captures certainly the bottom line and is very close to capturing the line above it. So the bottom two scenarios, this is the IPCC, this is not Republicans, the bottom two scenarios fall under half a degree, more or less, give or take. Many of you were between two and four degrees, and that covers the other three scenarios. Any of you who said more than four degrees are operating outside the findings of the IPCC and not supported by the summary for policymakers. So <laughs> Republicans start to think that we wait towards the worst outcomes rather than waiting towards the most likely outcomes. And this is clear from Roger Polka Jr., who's a, an academic in this space. Um, and he was tweeting, I, I have no idea if he's a Republican or not, but, but he looks um, critically at IPCC reports. And so he's tweeting about the IPCC reports when it comes out. And he says on the left hand side, the likelihood of high emission scenarios such as 8.5 is considered low. And that's in quotations because that's what the IPCC says. So the IPCC itself says that this top line is probably not the pathway we're on. But then he comes to the right hand side and says, well, actually, there's a big problem here. The IPCC has admitted that 8.5 is not very likely. And yet, if you look at the mentions of the different scenarios across the report, it gets 41.5% of the mentions. Whereas the scenarios it considers more likely, the ones in the middle, get under a fifth of the mentions. So implausible scenarios get more than half of the mentions. And therefore, and I think this is really important, we understand this as an academic community, the view of the people who don't want to take climate action is that we have a tendency to stress worst outcomes as most likely outcomes. And, and they will go well beyond climate change to point this out. So they will point about failures on BSE and COVID mortality prediction, again, too pessimistic. 
about short-term predictions of the costs of Brexit. Now, we've no idea if Brexit will work or not in the end, but we can falsify some of the short-term predictions that were made. And also some short-term climate predictions. So the US Navy predicted an ice-free summer by 2016, as late as 2013. And that is where this scepticism from highly educated people on the political right is coming from. And my personal opinion is that we need to engage with this a little bit, a little bit more constructively. Now, many of you in the room will absolutely disagree with this and you will still stick with your predictions and you'll say the problem is, is that we underestimate the risk of catastrophe. And that may be true. I, I, I cannot stress enough. I am not expressing a personal opinion here. But where the two sides differ and the way it matters for me is in their views about catastrophic climate change how likely it is and how severe it's likely to be. Now, why does this matter for me? Well, here are three quotations from three of the best people in my field. And we'll go with Pindyke's quote, quote at the cost. The economic case, remember, I'm a financial economist. The economic case for stringent greenhouse gas abatement cannot be made on most likely outcomes. Instead, any case for stringent abatement must be based on the possibility of a catastrophic climate outcome. So it is the probability and severity of climate catastrophes that drive the empirical results from my work. And the problem we have is that the IPCC is quite quiet about this because it's so hard to know. We have never seen a climate catastrophe. We have no idea how bad that is. And it's really, really difficult to assess a probability to associate with that in a quantitative sense that I need to help people work out the social cost of carbon. And because of that, if we go away from Republicans versus Democrats and look at what uh, academics think, they are very, very diverse in their views on what the social cost of carbon should be. And this is because none of them, it, it's just so hard to work out these catastrophic outcomes. You will see that on average, climate scientists want higher climate carbon taxes than economists. But in both, you will see that there are a number of academic experts on both sides, clearly the, the small minority view, that say that carbon taxes should be very small. Just one another couple of minutes on unlimited wants and limited resources. There's no doubt that climate change is a major, major threat. So there is an estimate here that a quarter of a million people each year will die from climate change damage. So that's, and that's in the relatively short term. That's within the next 30 years. But that's only a fifth of the number of people who we watch to die from the um, relative calm of York from dirty water sources in 2017. There are people dying today who have preventable sources of uh, mortality um, that we are not uh, that we are not addressing, and many more millions are dying from inhaling dirty air, particularly from um, burning fuel indoors. So the question about trading lives today against trading lives tomorrow is one that we are taking, whether we like it or not. And my work requires me to be quite direct about this in, in a way that is also true for health economists. So what I think we would all agree is that climate change is somewhere between a catastrophe and a problem, 
But there are many other things that are also somewhere between a catastrophe and a problem. And I would argue that us sitting here in the West watching people die from drinking wa dirty water is catastrophic. But I'm back to my partisanship. This is a this is a survey of what people care about. And the further you go to the right, are things that Democrats concern, are, are more concerned about. And the higher you go up are things that Republicans are more concerned about. And the solid line, diagonal line, is things that are non-partisan. Um, there are plenty of those, but I've just excluded them from this chart. And this won't surprise you at all. So Democrats are worried about poverty and race and climate and health. And people on the right are worried about the economy and terrorism and crime. Now, one of the ways I knew you were a fairly standard academic audience is because none of you really, I think one of you wanted to cut, cut health costs and nearly all of you wanted to cut military costs. And so we're talking about preferences well beyond here, the realms of climate change. Now, climate change is expensive. If we're going to stop this, if we're going to go to net to carbon neutrality, just in America, it's going to cost about a trillion dollars a year. And as I implied earlier in my in my mentee questions, somebody has to pay for this. This is a bit of a complicated slide, but it'll only take me a minute. At the bottom, we have what the UK government spends money on at the moment. So those of you who want to cut defence, I'm afraid there's almost mo no money in defence. Defence only has... Have you got me? Are, are you there, Ali? Yes, I think you're back. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I'm sorry. Did you lose me? I'm sorry about that. Are you there, Ali? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Most of the money by the government is being spent on things that the left already, the Democrats, Labour supporters already care about. Health costs, pension, welfare. And therefore, when I'm being, I don't know you well enough as an audience to do this, but if I was being very direct with you, the question I'd ask is, would you support a 25% cut in the NHS budget in order to pay for climate change, to make you trade off two things that you um, that you uh, that you really care about. Uh, the top is the extent of public borrowing and public taxes, both of which are near historic highs in the UK at the moment. And therefore, if we do borrow more and tax more, we're going into pretty uncharted fiscal territory um, at the moment. Um, and so you'd really need to be fiscally confident before you did that. And I, I absolutely uh, don't have the expertise to comment uh, on that. So it's not quite clear where the government is getting money from. In terms of households, um, the American data and the UK data is very similar. Households will pay about £20, 20, £20 a month for climate change action. I'm afraid when you aggregate that up by the number of households, that doesn't get you anywhere near the trillion dollars you need um, in, in America. So the people who po politicians have to get votes for are not prepared to fund climate change to the extent it's needed, and therefore they have to worry about the votes. Finally, if I ask you, do you want a sustainable pension? You'll say yes. If I say to you, do you want a personal pension, but you're going to have a smaller pension as a consequence, the answer to that is very likely no. So this, I've tried very briefly to, to explain the implications for my work of being policy neutral, but, policy, but politically sensitive. But my final slide is why I decide to take that position. And that is because I am a typical academic nerd when it comes to discount rates. I could bore you for hours on discount rates. 
but I know nothing about atmospheric physics. I know nothing about the ecology. I know nothing about a whole range of other things that feed into the climate change agenda. And therefore, when I'm being consulted in a professional capacity, I find it difficult to talk about climate change generally because so much of it I am not an expert on. Even if I were an expert on it, I am definitely not an expert on healthcare or social care or defence budgets or all the other calls on the public purse that politicians have to make. And finally, finally, I am delighted to say I don't have to go out and get votes, nor do I have to worry about fiscal environments and the amount of borrowing and taxation that governments can defend within a democracy. And because of that, I feel unqualified professionally to talk about climate change policy. And that is why I take the policy position I do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we've got some a few questions. Uh, I'll just wait for another few seconds. I've noted down a few questions and I'll ask you, but I'm just waiting for people now to vote for those questions. Now they can just go through the chat. OK, while they do that, I think one of the questions, Mark, that uh, many people have asked, but in different ways, and I think you've been struggling with this yourself, but let me ask you this again. Uh, and I think people have asked it a different way, but I think it, it is something like this, that as academics, or what is the role of universities, given that there's so much polarization in debates like climate change or many other things? What is the role of universities and academics in these kind of debates? So, so I don't think I have a universal truth for that. I can only say what I feel comfortable with um, in my own professional capacity. Um, and I think my job is to give governments the very, very best advice on the narrow subject of intergenerational social discount rates I can and to give it in an honest way. Uh, but at the same time, I have to be sensitive to the audience I'm talking to. And I need to understand as, as a Bayesian, you need to know what people's priors are to try and work out uh, where their questions are going to come from and where their posteriors are likely to, to end up. Um, I get very uncomfortable talking in a professional setting about anything other than discount rates. Does that answer your question, Ali? That, that's good. Another question is on carbon taxes. So I yes. wonder what Mark's view is on carbon taxes as one way to counter uh, for social cost. Um, so you're going to get my, I don't have a view, but actually I do have a view on this. Um, uh, I do think we should have carbon taxes. Um, I do think that, um, as Obama said at the start, um, we should charge people externalities and, and carbon taxes are the most obvious way of dealing with externalities. Uh, the problem you've got, as you saw from that slide of experts, is some academics think that carbon taxes should be five dollars and some academics think that carbon taxes should be a thousand dollars. And and trying to work out, as I say, because it's so so much depends on the probabilities that you associate with catastrophic outcomes is really difficult to get consensus on that. Um, but I guess this talk is partly to try and engage more constructive debate between the different sides of, uh, of the of the of different positions. So somewhat related to what you've just said, Mark, uh, there's a question about how do we then deal with politicians and politics? Well, that is very, very hard. You, even, even, even if you're an expert in your own area and you don't know what is happening in other areas. So how do we sort of combine those and then engage with politicians and the political process. So for me, again, personal view, I wouldn't engage with the political process at all. I don't think that's my job. Um, politicians are very experienced in engaging in policy informed decision making and working with civil servants. So I think if you're very clear with them up front about the terms of engagement, that's why I think we need to be so clear about the terms of engagement. If you say to them, I am going to give you the advice and I, I understand what your concerns are and I will try and address those concerns in the way I present my advice. 
um, they shouldn't really push you push you any further. But I, I, I think they're pretty knowledgeable and clever about the way they do this. Uh, we move to, there, there are a lot of comments on the chat, so I think it's sometimes difficult to understand whether it's a comment or it's a question. So I think one thing that Nick uh, mentioned in the chat, and I think this was in response to Henry's question about fat tails, that you you assign bigger weight to those very extreme events, and Nick's comment uh, responds to that, and I would like to take your view on this. Now I need to find that. So Nick, uh, Henry's comment is better to be overly pessimistic than optimistic if devastating outcomes with unknown probability is to be avoided. So he's referring to fat tails there. So, uh, so can, can I say that one? Yes. Andy? So that's a really interesting point. So precautionary principle, right? So you're better to do something than do nothing. The trouble is there are all sorts of precautionary principles. Um, I was in a senior leaders meeting at the university where I was being asked for my views on education um, 10 years hence. And this was in uh, November 2019. And everybody talked about increased technology and the way it was going to change. And it kept, the deputy vice chancellor pointed to me and said, what do you think, Mark? And I said, well, it's been a long time since we had a pandemic. And the problem with the precautionary principle is that there are an awful lots of things you need to be precautionary about. Um, and then you have to, and Pindyke talks about this a lot, you've got to have your pecking order of which are the most serious. Um, you know, Ukraine has introduced another thing about which we need to have a precautionary principle at the moment. And in a world of limited resources, even under a pre precautionary principle, you still need to prioritize where you're going to spend. Yeah, yeah. So I think that I, I mentioned that that it seems that there's a lot of votes to cut defense budget. So even assuming that in the UK that budget is very high, given the situation that we are in at the moment, maybe there's a rethink needed there as well. So I think Nick responded to uh, that comment about fat tails uh, as follows. Is there a tipping point beyond which pessimism inhibits the appropriate response and the creativity? It may depend on. Um, so I absolutely don't know. That's a question for uh, for a climate scientist, which 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 I'm not. Um, I think I'm repeating myself, but the problem with the IPCC reports is that they concentrate on likely outcomes and they're poor about the tails. And there's a good reason for that. They're not poor because they're, it's a bad report. It's, they're poor about the tails because it's just so difficult to know what they'll look like. And the results of my models and models that people like me produce are so sensitive to those tails that it makes it really, really difficult, I think. Yeah. So another thing that, Mark, you, you showed us slides about dealing with the future, and then you highlighted uh, the inequalities today that we are facing. Uh, uh, I don't know the exact number, 1.25 million people dying today. So I think that brings us to the environmental justice as well. And do you think sometimes thinking about the far ahead future, we may not be able to invest in dealing with the current environmental justice issues? So there are a number of responses to that, I think. Uh, one of which is that inequality matters, injustice matters whenever it is. Yeah. So, so we need to we need to think about this across the piece. But my co-authors say that you have one policy tool for one policy objective, and therefore you should should have separate tools either today or through climate change in dealing with the um, heterogeneity of outcomes than dealing with global climate change. So carbon tax is a single policy tool aimed at reducing, at the simplest level, changes in global temperatures. So you have one policy tool, one objective. If you then say, well, I'm, I'm worried about the inequalities caused by climate change, the fact that Bangladesh and the Maldives will be worse hit than Britain, well then that's a separate policy objective and that requires a separate policy tool. So 
I'm all in favour of carbon taxes for for dealing with the externalities of emissions, but I think you need another tool either today or in the future to deal with inequalities. So this is a, I think this could become a quite a big question. Uh, Mark, do you agree that we need to revisit the paradigmatic framework uh, for human economic activities given the IPCC's IPCC establishes that human actions are causing uh, the, the climate harm. So we do need to do that paradigm and that it shifts in the way we think about human activity. So uh, for example, I've, I've heard from some people we need to reduce production, we need to lay less emphasis on GDP growth, for example. So is that is that an issue as well when we engage with policymakers or engage with other others around us? Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a technical point around that. I mean, we have to remember that life expectancy across the world and literacy and child mortality uh, have improved beyond all recognition as a consequence of economic growth. And that if we stop economic growth, that will have its own offsetting costs. Um, and therefore, again, we're trading off, aren't we? There's no question that growth and using up uh, our natural resources now will have a cost to the environment in the future. But if we say to developing countries, well, you can't grow any more, then that will have a consequence on literacy and life expectancy. And again, I've, I think it's for policymakers to, to trade these things, to trade these things off. Our job as academics is to tell them what those consequences are, and then to leave it to them to decide how to work these things out. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. So uh, I think this would be a final question from Andrew Stark. Uh, is, the, is, here as well. is the old distinction between risk and uncertainty relevant here? Uh, yes, um, is, is the short answer to that. And Andy, you will think I've failed the profession because um, all my models are risk based, not uncertainty based. So for the rest of the audience, risk are basically things you can, forgive me for oversimplifying, but risks are things you can assign probabilities to, and uncertainties are just so uncertain, you can't even begin to frame them in a, in a standard probabilistic way. Um, as with many things, Andy, like um, the use of real options for valuation and a whole load of other things, many of the um, completely basic questions haven't been answered. So for example, um, Social discounting is pretty much invariably done at a risk free rate. So there's no beta in there. And this is discounting trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars worth of, of damages. So um, the literature is, is in, in some ways really undeveloped. And I don't think it's anywhere close to getting into a proper treatment of uncertainty or a proper treatment of real options. I think we're a long way off that. If we can get some measures of systematic risk taken more um, uniformly into the policy, into a policy agenda, I think that would be a good thing. And that's an example where I would give advice, you know, direct advice, Ali, should the discount rate depend on the risk of what we're looking at. Absolutely it would, and I would tell the policymaker that. But I'm restricting my advice to the discussion about discount rates rather than the discussion about climate change. Okay, I think we are running out of time. So on behalf of the, the Centre of the Open University and all the participants, can we all thank Mark Freeman for a really engaging session? And I think I have personally learned a lot from this uh, in the way that maybe I think if I'm going to engage with policymakers at some point, there are a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from this discussion. So once again, Mark, thank you very much. And I, I hope that uh, there, are, there are no more questions. But again, thank you very much. And thank you to all participants. We have participants from Australia, from uh, Africa, from uh, Asia. And uh, this recording will be available, as I mentioned at the start. Uh, once again, thanks to, to all of you and bye and have a good day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody.